Today we are going to start the second chapter, it is called first order partial differential equations. In this chapter we will study first order partial differential equations and Cauchy problem associated to that and what are the possibilities in terms of existence, uniqueness and maybe non-existence as well we will discuss. Now in today's lecture what we are going to discuss is how the first order PDEs appear, how they arise and the Cauchy problem, initial value problem and initial boundary value problems what are they we will discuss uh, briefly. So the outline for today's lecture is uh, the first point is how the first order PDEs appear. We will see uh, two situations, one of them is going to be a physical situation and the other one is within mathematics, mathematical situation. And then we define these terms Cauchy problem, initial value problem, initial boundary value problem for uh, first order PDEs. We look at three examples which suggest us uh, what happens or what can happen to a Cauchy problem in terms of uh, existence of solutions, uniqueness. And then we look at a simple first order PDE for which we consider IBVP that is initial boundary value problem and we study what are the possibilities there. Now how the first order PDEs appear? So first order PDEs arise in many situations, we are going to just see uh, two instances. The first one being uh, as a mathematical model for a physical phenomena. In fact, what we, what we are going to see is not really a physical phenomena, it just models uh, the traffic on a highway. And then we see uh, a, as equations satisfied by some mathematical objects. So this is the physical model which we are going to look at today, is a mathematical model for traffic flow. So in this model, we are going to have two main ingredients, we will briefly introduce them. So one of the most fundamental physical principles is what are called conservation laws or balance laws and one encounters them already in a course of mechanics where we would have seen conservation of mass, energy and angular momentum. So we are going to derive a PDE model in a, simil, in a simpler situation. We call it simpler because no a priori knowledge of anything is needed including physics. Okay. As I told you we are not going to do really a physical model, it is going to actually a model of the traffic flow which can be easily understood. So let us consider an express highway without any intermediate entry or exit points. It has one entry point, one exit, exit point. You cannot join the expressway in between or you can leave, both possibilities are not there. Leaving and joining is not possible. So the traffic what we mean is let us say vehicles, let us say cars just to refer very easily. Assume that vehicles are moving in a straight line, as we know vehicles do not move straight lines, they will be overtaking one another. But what this means is that this gives us a, a way to identify the highway as an interval in R. And it actually physically means that overtaking is not allowed, maybe the expressway is very narrow, so you cannot overtake. Now let rho denote the car density at a point x in r, yes rho is not infinite, but then uh, we are going to finally uh, specialize to certain intervals. Okay. So at the time instant t, what does this mean? Car density means what? we can get the number of cars by integrating with respect to x. So let a be less than b, then the number of cars in the interval a b, in terms of the highway it may be a stretch between a point a and a point b, at time t is given by the integral of rho over the interval a b. Now we need to know how it changes, so the instantaneous rate of change at time t is given by the derivative of this number d by dt of the integral a to b rho x t dx. But who is really responsible for this change? It is, an, it is the cars which are entering at the point A and leaving from the point B. Therefore the same number is given by the influx of cars at A minus outflux of cars at B which is QAT minus QBT. Both are same numbers because 
we made this assumption of no entry or no exit. Thus, we have this balanced law. So, both these quantities are balanced. Therefore, d by dt of integral a to b rho x t is equal to q a t minus q b t that is the balance. So, the balance law is now d by dt a to b rho x t dx equal to q a t minus q b t. Now, we are going to modify the right hand side. The right hand side we write it as as an integral. So, if you use this fundamental theorem of calculus will give you q a t minus q b t. So, interchanging the order of differentiation and integration in the first term d by d t is outside the integral we can take it inside. Yeah, of course, we know that this is not true all the time it is not allowed one needs justifications, but this where I say no bargaining ends at the very first instance. So, do not ask that questions right now they can be asked later. So, now once the d by dt go inside the integral the balance law becomes a to b dou rho by dou t equal to minus integral a to b dou q by dou x. Now, let us take the RHS to the left hand side and then the balance law becomes integral a to b of this quantity dou rho by dou t plus dou q by dou x equal to 0. Now, this is true for every a and b such that a less than b. In other words, you have integral of certain quantity is 0 over every interval a b. It means that integrand has to be 0. This is an exercise in analysis we would have encountered many such situations. For example, if you take a continuous function integral integrate on any interval a b and if the result is 0 then the continuous function has to be 0. And there are generalizations of this which may be let us say a local integrable function. If you integrate on any set and the integral is 0 then the function must be 0. So, these are two typical instances where we can conclude this. Now, what remains is the equation has a row that is what is the traffic about we want to study about this, but there is an unknown quantity q the flux it is not known therefore, we need to model that. Therefore, it is reasonable to think that q depends on x time t and the density of cars itself that is rho. So, q can be thought can be uh, thought of as a function of x t and rho. Okay. This kind of proposition of what kind of a function it is of the variables x t and rho is what is called a constitutive law. Of course, there will be as many models as the number of constitutive laws. So, constitutive law models how q depends on x t rho. Consider a simplest constitutive law which is given by q of x t rho uh, since x t is not involved in this formula I have not written x t. So, q of rho equal to c rho where c is a positive number. This means the flux is proportional to the number of cars. So, substituting this in the balance law what we get is dou rho by dou t plus c times dou rho by dou x equal to 0. This equation is called a linear transport equation. This is a linear equation is clear because the unknown quantity rho, rho itself does not appear. What appears is their first order derivatives dou rho by dou t and dou rho by dou x it appears with a power 1. So, this is a first order linear equation c is a constant. Therefore, it is a linear equation why is it called transport equation something must be transported from somewhere to somewhere it must be uh, from some time uh, t equal to something to future times. So, in deriving this model recall that there were two main ingredients first one was balance law and second one is a constitutive law or constitutive relation. Balance laws are very general constitutive relations model the specificness of the uh, situation in this case of the highway. So, in our model we use the constitutive relation as q rho equal to c rho. In general q may be more general function of x t and rho. In that case the balance law becomes this dou rho by dou t plus dou by dou x of q of x t rho. If you expand this you will get 
this one. So, you need to differentiate x appears here as well as in row. Therefore, need to differentiate q with respect to the first variable and differentiate q with respect to the last variable and differentiate rho with respect to x. This is a chain rule. So, a chain rule is a very important rule that one must be very comfortable uh, when you want to do anything with uh, differentiation. Okay. So, this is a quasi linear equation, it is a first order PDE. Quasi linear because this may depend on rho, okay. that is why it is a quasi linear equation. Now, we are going to model uh, a highway where entries and exits are there in between. That means, we will see now how the earlier model derived is going to change. So, the entries and exits are also called source and sinks uh, in the PDE literature. So, let f denote the source sink density at x at the time instant t. Now, the model becomes this is the rate of change. Earlier this was just equal to the flux, but now this will also have the source sink term which is this integral a to b f x t t x. Now, bringing everything to one side what we get is integral a to b of certain thing is 0 and this is true once again as before for every a and b such that a is less than b both are arbitrary therefore, the integrand must be 0 which will be the case whenever the integrand is continuous or local integrable but it is not unreasonable to assume that integral of over any set is 0 implies the integrand is 0. Now, let us look at the how the first order PDs appear in a mathematical context. So, we are going to see an example. Consider a two parameter family of surfaces. Surfaces in fact, what we are going to consider is surfaces which are graphs z equal to f of x, y, a, b. What are a and b? They are some parameters varying in some intervals. So, it is a two parameter family of graphs of functions. Now, we want to derive a differential equation satisfied by this family and we are saying partial differential equation. Therefore, what we can only do here is to differentiate this with respect to the two independent variables x and y and this is the expression we get. Now, assume that from these two relations you can solve a as a function phi of x, y, z, x, z, y and the b as a function of psi x, y, z, x, z, y. Now, question is, is it always possible? These are all questions. But here, if it is possible, we will go ahead and do the next step. What is the next step? I am going to substitute for a and b these formulas inside this. Then what I will have is z equal to f of x, y, phi of x, y, z, x, z, y, comma psi of x, y, z, x, z, y, which will be a nonlinear partial differential equation. In general. Now, let us look at a specific example where the functions are taken to be x minus a whole square plus y minus b whole square, a and b are parameters varying in real numbers, both of them are real numbers. Now, what are these surfaces? What does this equation represent? Represents cones, family of cones. So, differentiate this relation with respect to x and y and eliminate a and b. In other words, solve for a and b in terms of rest of the things. So, here it is very simple a equal to x minus z x by 2, b equal to y minus z y by 2. Now, substitute the values of a and b inside this expression z equal to x minus a whole square plus y minus b whole square, which is the equation of the family of surfaces. Once you do that and simplify, you get this following PDE z x actually stands for dou z by dou x. Okay. If you want to write in terms of x, you can write dou u by dou x whole square plus dou u by dou a whole square equal to 4 u. Now, let us see what are the problems uh, by the which go by the name of Cauchy or initial value or initial boundary value problems, what they are. So, let us consider a PDE f of x, y, u x, u, u x, u y equal to 0 it means I am considering a PDE in two independent variables. Throughout this chapter, 
we are going to consider first order PDE in two independent variables and then we will also say what how theory changes if you have one more variable. So, x, y and are independent variables, u is the dependent variable these are the derivatives. So, there are 5 quantities here. So, f must be defined on a subset of R5 and that we denote as omega 5 is a subset of R5 and you have a function and then this will then define a partial differential equation. So, what is a Cauchy problem? Given a space curve gamma in R3 that means you are given a curve in R3 which is described parametrically by this that is x, y, z equal to f s, g s and h s as s varies in some interval i. And f, g, h are Seaman functions on the interval i and such that the projection gamma to of gamma to x, y plane where is gamma? It is an R3. So, it will have x, y, z coordinates. Now, you project it to the x, y plane you will have x, y coordinates. Okay, that is x equal to f s and y equal to g s that is the curve gamma 2. S in CMI. It is a regular curve. What that means is f dash g dash do not vanish, that means does not become 0, 0 at every point of the curve. If one of them is 0, other one is non 0. If f dash is 0, g dash is non 0. And find a solution to the PDE such that u of f s g s equal to h s for s belonging to a sub interval of i, sub interval of i. In other words, a part of gamma lies on this surface s denoted by s equation is set of all x, y, z such that z equal to u x, y. On this surface, a part of this curve given curve gamma lies, right. Gamma coordinates are f s, g s and h s. So, third coordinate h s must be equal to u of first two coordinates f s g s that is the condition here. We are not requiring that this should happen for every s in i, we are only asking for s belonging to sub interval of i. So, this can be thought of as a local solution. So, this gamma is called a data curve or datum curve or initial curve. Note that this problem actually makes sense only if gamma is subset of omega 3. What is omega 3? is a projection of omega 5 which is in R5 to the first three coordinates x, y, u. Okay, what is initial value problem? It is a special type of Cauchy problem. Initial means there is something like a time in the problem and initially means at some particular time in the past something is happening and then you are interested in studying the equation for future times. So, therefore, one of the variables will have an interpretation of time, let it be y, there is no loss of generality in assuming y, x would equally do the same thing. So, the y variable has an interpretation of the time variable and the datum curve now lies in the zx plane given by this x equal to s, y equal to 0, z equal to h s. In other words, what we will be asking is actually u of x comma 0 equal to h of x should be satisfied. This is what we are asking for the Cauchy for the solution of the PDE. So, find u of x t such that u t plus 2 u x equal to 0 and u x 0 equal to sin x. Okay. Parametric representation of gamma, what is gamma? x equal to s, y equal to or here t equal to 0, it is not y, it should be t because y has a interpretation of time variable. So, you can as well write t. So, t equal to 0 and z equal to sin s and s belongs to r that is the parametric representation of gamma. Now, we do not know how to solve this for now, but given a formula we can always check that it is a solution. So, u of x t equal sin of x minus 2 t if you quickly differentiate you will get that u t plus 2 x equal 0 it solves the initial value problem. So, when t equal to 0 this formula u of x 0 what will we get? u of x 0 will be sin x 
So, initial condition is satisfied. So, we can think of like this uh, <coughs> okay. So, this is the time variable, this is the u variable, this is the time this is x at t equal to 0 you are given a sin x like that. Okay. So, you have to imagine this in the ux plane and then at t equal to half what you will have is a formula from the formula what we have is it is sin x minus 1. So, u of x comma half is sin x minus 1. It just means the graph of sin has been shifted to x equal to 1. Suppose this is 1, this is pi right. So, this pi by 2, so this is 1.5 already. So, it is somewhere here. So, the graph will look like uh, this, it is moving. Okay? So, it is difficult to write for me in 3 dimensions, but you should imagine that the graph of sin x has moved, graph was like this at t equal to 0. Now, it has shifted to 1, but now this I am writing at t equal to half, so it just moves back. So, okay. Now, initial boundary value problems. Once again, initial is there, so there should be a time. So, the unknown u in this PDE, x t u u x u t equal to 0. I already made this change of y to t because the word of initial y boundary. So, this equation or what you want to study, it may not be relevant for, for all x in R. It may be that it is relevant only for x positive or maybe for x in some bounded interval a b. In such cases, imagine the first case if it is meaningful only in R plus then x equal to 0 is a boundary of r plus right boundary point. And if you are studying x in a b then there are two boundary points x equal to a and x equal to b at these points. So, you need to prescribe some conditions there that is what is called initial boundary value problem. Okay? Yeah. Now, let us lo do a look at a picture illustration. So, this is the case where the domain is r plus, x belongs to r plus, therefore you have boundary at x equal to 0. So, you prescribe this g, of course initial condition you prescribe. Now, when you are doing initial boundary value problem, when x belongs to this interval a b, you have to give initial conditions and also give boundary conditions. So, now let us look at 3 examples, 3 guiding examples for us Cauchy problems because you can understand entire theory by using these examples. Before that let us ask the following question, does every Cauchy problem have a solution? Good question, this question sounds like a very familiar questions that we asked earlier, does every problem have a solution? This is not the first time we came across such a question. It was asked many times and many times we even had a complete answer. For example, system of linear equations uh, where A x equal to B where A is a square matrix, there we understand completely and what conditions you have existence, what condition you have uniqueness and non-existence. Now, let us ask the same question in some few uh, well-known situations for us before. Solutions of polynomial equations in one real variable. What about that? A polynomial may not have a solution. Polynomial equation x square plus 1 equal to 0 has no real solution. It can have exactly one solution. Let us say x minus 1 equal to 0 or x into x square plus 1 equal to 0. They have exactly one solution. Then you can have finitely many solutions. Let us take very simple x minus 2 into x minus 3 equal to 0. Right? Any finite number, let us say a1, a2, an, you write x minus a1 into x minus a2 into x minus an equal to 0, precisely these are the solutions a1, a2, an. But you cannot have infinitely many solutions for polynomial equations. That is because of fundamental theorem of algebra. It says given a non-constant polynomial, it has exactly the same number of roots as the degree counting multiplicities in the complex plane. Therefore, in real numbers may be less than or equal to that. Then solutions to initial value problems for ODEs. This is where we have seen uh, Picard's theorem. 
and Peano's theorem. In Peano's theorem, if the right hand side, let us say y dash equal to f x y, let us write once, this is the kind of equations for which we have a theory and this is the initial value problem. If f was continuous, we had Peano's theorem which said there is a solution. In addition, if f is Lipschitz with respect to the y variable, then Picard's theorem told us that it has a unique solution. And when you do not have unique solution, you can easily show that you have infinitely many solutions. That is the situation about ODE. So, this is under sufficient conditions that we have proved these theorems. So, if these sufficient conditions are not satisfied, we have no idea what will happen, anything may happen. You may still have uniqueness even though the right hand side function f is not Lipschitz, that is a possibility. Now, solutions to boundary value problems, we have a Bernstein theorem under some sufficient conditions, it guarantees that uh, a second order uh, ODE boundary value problem posed for that will have a unique solution, at least when the Dirichlet data. Okay. This if you do not, um, if you are not studied BVPs, so you can look at any good book on ordinary differential equations, you will find. Then solutions to transcendental equation, this is the most difficult one, you have no, it is not like polynomials. So, you have to worry with uh, each separate equation is a different story. There are once again sufficient conditions. Okay. Now, let us uh, see what are the examples. So, the examples we are going to see are, are of Cauchy problems. In these three examples, which demonstrate all three possibilities. In this case, what are the possibilities? You have a unique solution, infinitely many solutions and no solution. Of course, another option is the finitely many solutions, which I have not thought about. Let us take, take that up in a tutorial session, that discussion. So, what does this mean? It means that we do not expect existence uniqueness theorem for free, for any first order PD, we do not expect. So, only under some special assumptions, in other words sufficient conditions, we can expect such theorems. Which was true in all our earlier cases, let us say in the ODE initial value problems or boundary value problems, that is true. Okay, Let us look at a very simple first order PDE, it is ux equal to cu, c is a constant. We will look at a special constants later, c equal to 1 and minus 1 later on in the case of initial boundary value problems. Here is c can be any number, real number. So, it is posed for x in r and t in r. You do not see t in the problem, so it is actually ODE and from our ODE knowledge we can solve this. Any solution must satisfy this equation uxt equal to u0 t into e power cx. Now, let us look at three Cauchy data, what are they? First one is u of 0 t equal to t, second is ux0 and here also ux0. That means initial Cauchy data is given here on t axis here in other two cases given on x axis. Now, using this expression we will get this u0 t you wanted t is supplied, so t into e power cx that is a solution. In this case ux0 that is t equal to 0 that is u0 0 into e power cx, but u0 0 must be 1. Therefore, any function of t such that t of 0 is 1 will do our job, it will be a solution. t t into c e power cx is a solution whenever t 0 equal to 1. Here, if u is a solution, then what is expected is sin x must be a multiple of e power cx, that is impossible because sin x and e power cx are always linearly independent as functions on any interval that you consider. So, message is that Cauchy data 1 unique solution, Cauchy data 2 and 3, one case you have infinitely many solutions, for Cauchy data 3 there are no solutions. So, three possibilities have been exhibited here. Now, the why the Cauchy problems behave differently? PD was the same, ux equal to cu, then what is different? u was prescribed on t axis, we had uniqueness and when u is prescribed on x axis, either we had infinitely many solutions or no solutions. Therefore, we ask the following question, is t axis something special for the equation or is it x axis which is special for this equation? Uh, the reason for the first question is because we have uniqueness. Second question is we have many possibilities. So, who is really special here? because special people have to be taken uh, care with a lot of special care. Okay? 
we will see that later on. So, the answers we will see later as we study the first order PDEs. Now, let us look at a simple first order PDE for which we pose IBVP and a few observations. We will not be dealing with this further in our course. So, the fact is that general solution of ud plus cux equal to 0 is given by uxt equal to phi of x minus ct where phi is any c1 function which is arbitrary. Of course, what is that t equal to 0 ux0 becomes phi x. So, this phi is nothing but the initial solution, initial condition. Okay. Now, initial boundary value problem as I told you there will be a PDE posed in the first quadrant x t x positive t positive initial condition is given and there is only one boundary point namely x equal to 0 therefore u of 0 t is also prescribed. Now, u x t equal to f of x minus c t because see here we said phi is the initial data right. So, therefore, here also we have initial data. So, how much we can this determines the solution. So, f of x minus c t will be a solution surely no problem. But whenever x minus c t belongs to the domain of f, f is defined only for greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, this determines a solution whenever x is bigger than or equal to c t. We will see a picture soon. Now, on the line x minus c t, the solution u will be constant, it will be f of k, x minus c t equal to k, k is greater than or equal to 0, therefore, this formula is applies and u x t equal to f k, it is constant. Now, let us look at the case where c equal to 1, this is the picture. So, this is u uh, x 0 f x, this is u 0 t g t and u in this region, in this region, this uh, the line x equal to t is in dots to the right side of that this region corresponds to x bigger than or equal to t there f of x minus c t. Similarly, you can show that here it will be g of t minus x that will be solution. So, on this line t minus x equal to k solution will be g k and on this line x minus c t equal to k solution will be f of k. So, initial condition determines u in this region and boundary condition determines in this region. Now, what about x line x equal to t what will happen? So, let us write the formula this is the formula that we said. Now, if this has to be a solution it has to be differentiable the first question is is it differentiable. So, this is a candidate solution we say because we have derived certain possible formula for the solution that is why we propose a candidate we need to verify that it is indeed a solution. So, that requires that f g must be c 1 functions and compatibility of the data is needed f 0 must be equal to z 0 f dash 0 equal to minus z dash 0. How do you get these compatibility conditions? You simply ask at points where x equal to t write down the differentiability property of u of x t that will tell you that this condition has to be met otherwise it would not be differentiable. So, once you have these compatibility conditions that implies that u has to use a c1 function. So, and IBVP has a unique solution. Now, the case c equal to minus 1 is totally different. Now, the line is x plus t equal to constant. This line touches both the boundary as well as the initial data. So, and once again f must be constant on this line, solution must be constant. Therefore, this line touches at k 0. So, it should the value on this line should be f k and it touches here at g 0 k. So, the answer must be the solution must be g of k. So, on this line the solution is both f of k and g of k. What if f of k is not equal to g of k? There is a problem. Okay. This means that g cannot be prescribed independent of f. This initial boundary value problem has no solution in general, but there are some generalized notions of solutions where under some other condition they admit uh, solutions. Okay. So, let us we will not be discussing such generalized notions this is in the normal notion of a solution there is no solution that is very clear from the formulae. So, let us summarize what we did today we have derived a first order PDE to model traffic flow 
and also modified to account for sources and sinks namely entries and exits in the expressway. And we highlighted the roles of balance law and constitutive relations in deriving mathematical models. This is how models in uh, let us say continuum mechanics will be derived. These are the two uh, things which are at the heart of any modeling. And then through three examples we understood that number of solutions to a Cauchy problem depends on the relation of the PDE to the datum curve. And then we saw IBVP problems need not have solutions. So, thank you.